Alright mates, how's it going? In today's video, I'm covering the Fallen Sun and a little bit of Siege of the Black Temple from Chronicle Volume 3. So let's go! When the Horde and the Alliance reached Shatrath City, Adar was pretty pleased with itself. Whilst Velen had done the actual legwork with his daring escape to Azeroth, Adar was the one who suggested it, so he totally deserved all of the credit. The Nauru now had allies to protect Outland from the Legion. Shatrath became a central hub of sorts, a staging ground for the Horde and the Alliance. Trade flourished between the peoples of Azeroth and the creatures of Outland. But it wasn't just weapons and armour being exchanged. The most valuable thing to trade in Shatrath was information, and most of the information came from Archmage Khadgar. He became an influential figure in the city. Even though he was a member of the Alliance, he knew the Horde would also play a crucial role in determining Outland's fate. What he really wanted to do was find a way to get the two factions working together and arm them with knowledge of Illidan's domain, because knowledge is power. As the campaign continued into Shadowmoon Valley, the Alliance rallied with another familiar Sons of Lothar face, Kurdrum Wildhammer. Him and his buddies had forged a stronghold in the area. It didn't have the most creative name in the world. It was called Wildhammer Stronghold. The Dwarves had spent time in this place watching the Black Temple and reporting what they saw back to Khadgar. So the Archmage was fully aware that Illidan was actually a little bit vulnerable at present. Rifts had formed between him and his lieutenants, Kel'thas had buggered off, the Blood Elves had abandoned him, and Akama wasn't exactly having a whale of a time. There wasn't really an army defending the Betrayer, so it was probably a good time to attack him. Both the Horde and the Alliance mostly agreed, Illidan had almost destroyed Zangamarsh, and he'd used Magtheridon to corrupt hundreds of Orcs. That guy was a jerk and needed to be stopped. But that didn't change the fact that most of the forces on Outland were still scattered across it. For instance, the Horde's Blood Elves, who were currently dealing with their own problems in Netherstorm. The Blood Elves had learned of their prince's fate in Shatrath. He pledged himself to the Burning Legion like some kind of idiot. At first, it was hard to believe. Why would he do that? Why would anyone do that? But when they ventured into Netherstorm, they saw the truth. Kalthas had embraced fell magic and allowed himself to become the Legion's pawn. So sod him. He was their prince no more. If you asked a Blood Elf at this point to tell you about Kalthas Sunstrider, their response probably would have been, Who? Never heard of him. They sent word back to Lothamar and the other high-ranking elves in Kalthalas. People cried a little bit, but they came to a consensus. Kill the treasonous twat. So the Horde made war on Kalthas and his followers. Their assault on Tempest Keep started, and just like Hellfire Citadel and Coilfang Reservoir, this fortress consisted of three dungeons and a raid. A little buttress note, while Mod of Viewer is having issues again, I can't seem to import armory links into the bugger, so I'm going to have to use random NPCs rather than people's characters. Sos mates! First, Horde Champions entered the Mechanar. This place was chosen by Kel'thas to be a factory where they'd create large amounts of power and store it in mana cells. But what was more concerning was that the mana cells were being transported somewhere else by Ethereals. How bloody mysterious! Next, they head into another satellite called the Botanica. This place had been used by Kel'thas to run experiments on Outland's flowers. Nauru technology can be used to create and manipulate living beings, which is slightly disturbing. Kel'thas was convinced they could figure out a way to use the technology to give Blood Elves even more power. But things hadn't gone so well, and a number of experiments were now roaming free. As a side note, if you ever want to grind some of the older factions' reputation, grab the relevant tabard, head to either Mechanar or Botanica, and just do them over and over again. I think there is a limit on how many times you can reset instances within an hour, but you'll be getting about 2 or 3k rep every time you complete the dungeon. However, it does get real boring real fast. Anyway, next the Horde Champions entered the Architraz, and as you may guess from the name, it's a prison. The Nauru jailed some of the most dangerous and terrifying creatures that they'd encountered on their journeys. Kel'thas had tasked a warden and guards to keep watch of the prison, but they were corrupted and some of the prisoners had started to break free. This particular dungeon includes the first appearance of Millhouse Manastorm. Originally, players needed to do the Architraz in heroic difficulty and ensure Millhouse survived the final encounter with Harbinger Skyrith. Then they'd get the Tempest Key, which would allow them access to the raid bit. Finally, after all of that, the Horde Champions entered the Eye, the inner sanctum of Tempest Keep and a 25-player raid. After fighting their way through a bunch of weird bosses, the Champions reached Tempest Bridge and started their battle against Kel'thas. In Phase 1, they found themselves fighting against the Prince's advisors, one by one. Thaladred the Darkener was up first. He would become fixated on one player and slowly walk towards them. And all that player needed to do was run away. After he fell, Lord Sanguinar got involved. Basically a tank and spank, but he'd use a fear ability every now and then, which was a little bit annoying. Grand Astromancer Capernian casted Arcane Explosion, if anyone was in melee range. 
and Master Engineer Telonicus was also a fairly straightforward fight. Once they'd been taken care of, Phase 2 started. Kel'thas then summoned a bunch of legendary weapons from his arsenal. The Horde Champions combined AoE attacks with Focus Fire to take all of those floating weapons down, and then picked them up and equipped them. So that kind of backfired on Kel'thas, and he probably felt a little bit embarrassed about the whole thing. In Phase 3, Kel'thas got a bit cheeky and resurrected all four advisors. They decided attacking at the same time was probably a better strategy this time around. Basically, the same tactics as Phase 1, but a bit more complicated because they're all going on at the same time. Ranged DPS focused on Thaladred first, whilst Melee concentrated on Sanguinar. Ranged would then move on to Capernaum, whilst Melee would finish off Telonicus. After about three minutes, Phase 4 started and Kel'thas joined the fight. The Prince had a number of fire-based abilities. Fireball, which the champions just interrupted so it was nothing to worry about. Flame Strike, which is easily avoidable and should therefore be avoided. He'd cast a combination of Shock Barrier, Free Pyroblasts and Arcane Disruption every 60 seconds. The champions figured out a way to interrupt one of the Pyroblasts, whilst the tank would use their legendary weapon to absorb another one, and then just take the third one to the face. Also, the former Prince would summon a Phoenix, which was a bit of an idiot. It would cast an ability that caused damage not only to the raid group, but also to itself, so eventually it just died. But being a Phoenix, it would turn into a Phoenix Egg. The champions destroyed the egg before it was reborn into another Phoenix though, so it, it was fine. Also, Kale would use an ability called Mind Control, which is great because everybody loves an excuse to use sheep on someone. Once Kel'thas was down to about 50% health, he became invulnerable for a bit whilst he started flying up into the air and growing, and the champions were forced to listen to a really loud, annoying sound for a little while. But once he got that out of his system, Phase 5 started. The only thing to worry about during this phase was Gravity Lapse. Kel would regularly cast this in combination with Nether Vapor and Nether Beam. However, the champions just kind of kept their distance, and eventually the former prince fell. And guess what? Ashes of Alar didn't drop. Kel surprise! The champions congratulated themselves and left Tempest Keep, but unbeknownst to them, Kael wasn't actually dead. Kil'jaeden had expected this defeat and made preparations. Demons spirited Kel'thas away and brought him back from the brink of death. However, there was little left of his mind. He was now 100% mental and 100% compliant to the Legion's bidding. As the Alliance and Horde now directed their forces towards the Black Temple, Kel'thas and his Legion buddies journeyed through the Dark Portal and made their way towards the Sunwell. Meanwhile, Illidan was a bit annoyed. He knew the forces from Shatrath City, the Alliance and the Horde were on his doorstep. And although he discovered the location of Argus, opening a portal to that planet wasn't going to be as simple as he'd hoped. Powerful enchantments surrounded the world, preventing a gateway from being opened. However, there was a solution. An artifact called the Sargorite Keystone, which was currently in a shattered world within the Twisting Nether called Mardoom. As a reminder, Mardoom is the prison world created by Sargeras back when he was still a member of the Pantheon. But Illidan was faced with a choice. Stay behind and defend the temple from the upcoming assault, or go get the Keystone. Our time is short. I will deal with these intruders. You must venture to Mardoom and retrieve the Sargerite Keystone. Now go, but remember, should you fail, all worlds will burn. And we're leaving it there! I had a feeling I wouldn't be able to fit the Black Temple Raid in here as well. In the next Volume 3 video, the Black Temple Raid, obviously. And also, Horde Champions do Zulaman, so that'll be great. If you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, all of that bollocks. And all that's left to say is, thanks for watching, and see ya!